At that time, this people in Jerusalem will be told, a scorching wind from the barren heights in the desert blows toward my people, but not to winnow or cleanse, a wind too strong for that comes from me. Now I pronounce my judgments against them. My people are fools, they do not know me. They are senseless children, they have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil, they know not how to do good. I looked at the earth and it was formless and empty, and at the heavens and their light was gone. I looked at the mountains and they were quaking. All the hills were swaying. I looked and there were no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. I looked and the fruitful land was a desert. All its town lay in ruins. Before the Lord, before his fierce anger, this is what the Lord says. The whole land will be ruined though I will not destroy it completely. In addition to the text from Jeremiah, I'd like to read the text from Luke for today as well. It's found in Luke chapter 15. We'll add that to the reading a little bit. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered, gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp? sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. All right, so <clears throat> we're going through our season of creation, and we've been talking a little bit about uh, the importance of being wise and good stewards of the gifts of creation that God has given to us, how we can pass it down, and how we can, uh, we can lengthen the table or make sure that there's a spot at the table for everybody, and not consume all of the resources, but leave some for other people. And if we were to really take uh, stock of what we needed, we could uh, probably find that we would do just fine with a little bit, perhaps less, and make sure that other people as well have things to take care of them. Uh, you know, speaking of that, um, I don't know, probably all of you remember, uh, especially if you've lived here in this country for the last dozen years or so, um, you probably have been affected by then and even now by the 2008 financial crisis. You all remember that, of course, 11 years ago or so. It was a lot of factors went into the creation of that huge fiasco, but a lot of experts and observers agree that a significant cause was the uh, practice of many banks to uh, create and sell trillions of dollars in mor mortgage-related securities. Uh, some of these contained what they knew to be uncollectible debt. Uh, the the uh, U.S. Secretary of the Treasurer from 2009 to 2013, Timothy Geithner, commented that most financial crises are caused by a mix of factors, including stupidity, greed, recklessness, risk-taking, and hope. It's a weird mixture of ingredients there that he said goes into this. Greed, recklessness, and selfishness. Uh, this is what is being talked about in that passage of Scripture from Jeremiah that was read earlier. 
these people in the uh, uh, these people in the tribe of Judah, in particular, in, in Jeremiah's time, they've been drawn to leave God's ways and pursue false gods instead. And we talked about this a few weeks ago, how they abandoned their covenant to love God and to care for their neighbors, and they only cared for themselves. The people engaged in practices that broke down rather than built up the community, and it was upsetting God. And we talked about how um, it shouldn't surprise us if God were to get angry about certain things, like injustice and oppression and people being taken advantage of. So of course God is upset when his people who are supposed to be following him pursue their own selfishness, selfishness and greed in such a way that it hurts and impacts the oppressed and the poor. Now, you can imagine that when this happens and things start to break down, chaos ensues, much like it did in the year 2008 with the financial crisis. So, Lots of chaos followed the bank crisis and failures of 2008, and that affected a lot of people. Defaults on mortgages increased. And with that, the price of housing sank. Some of you probably know this. And it left many people owing more on their property than they could actually recover if they sold it. Unemployment and underemployment rose the recession prompted employment cutbacks at many companies. Uh, Ryan uh, Gina, a uh, financial economist, said on his website, even if you didn't lose your job, there's a possibility that your hours were cut or that you lost some benefits. Underemployment is perhaps a lesser problem than unemployment, but it's still a problem, he said. Clearly, those who were already living on the edge of solvency were most affected. Now, in our denomination, the United Methodist Church, you might say that right now chaos is going on. You've probably read the headlines and know uh, what I'm talking about there. You know that our denomination is in a time of uncertainty and it feels like chaos. Many people are searching for ways to return order to the church. They're offering solutions, and they're offering compromises, and there's votes, and there's different things like that, and yet it still seems like we're just spiraling in chaos. Maybe some of you are feeling that. And if you're not feeling it there, maybe you're feeling it in your own life a little bit in some way. It seems like chaos is always a part of life in some form. Well, I want to tell you a little bit about our creation story in scriptures. Now, the, in the Hebrew uh, Bible, in the, what we call the Old Testament in the book of Genesis, contains an account of creation. And uh, the creation story that's told there didn't arise in a vacuum. Actually, that story was very similar to other creation stories at the time that were being told. Um, there were other ancient creation stories that had a lot of similar themes. And in fact, there's probably the most well-known creation story aside from the Genesis story is the story that's called the Enuma Elish. Right? We're probably all familiar with that, right? Yeah? Okay. The Enuma Elish was the Babylonian creation story. And in this story, what happened is basically there... Um, uh, gods were created first, you know, by some uh, larger entity or being. And uh, amongst these gods, these smaller gods, I guess you could say, the, a war ensued and a battle of who would be the most supreme of these gods took place. And it came down to these two in particular. Um, <coughs> and they... Uh, uh, divvied up their sides and had allies and, and of course they were enemies with each other and one god uh, was able to trick the other god and uh, slew that god and, and the story of creation for them is that um, basically the battle that ensued between them was what created all of everything and humankind was formed from the blood that was shed by one of the gods that was 
it gets pretty bloody. It's a, it's a gory, gory story, but the one God split the other God in two and different things happened and, and half of, one God, of that God's body became um, the night sky or the, uh, the, uh, the sky and the other half became, you know, earth and then the blood of that God became man. And so it's a very violent story. Now, that was just one creation story. But all of the ancient creation stories had similar themes like this of battles and fights and violence that ended up causing creation. In the middle of this, a unique creation story was told. And it's this story that we have in the book of Genesis. What's different about this story is if you read it, there is... Uh, at the beginning it says, you know, we read it as uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the spirit of God hovered over the waters. And actually that word for waters there that we've translated into waters is actually um, more similar to the word chaos. That God hovered over this chaos and it's really like this formless, voidless, wasteful emptiness is kind of the idea of the chaos in the Hebrew language that they have. And God is hovering over it and here's where it takes a twist compared to all the other creation stories. All the other creation stories have a fight, a battle, some bloodshed in order for creation to happen. But in this story, God speaks and invites something to come out of the chaos. God whispers almost, as it were, and invites this chaos to participate in creation. It's as if God is wooing and calling to this chaos, come and work with me, and we will create. Not dominating it, like in other creation stories, not crushing it, not a bloody war, instead working with the chaos to bring beauty out of it. It's a very different creation story. Now this month's journey through the book of Jeremiah, as we've read it, it gets tough, it's hard, God is speaking, the prophet is speaking on behalf of God and is, is saying some tough things. And it seems like this story in the, the scripture it gradually, it is gradually um, aiming towards chaos. And this week we've arrived. What does it say here? It says that God through the prophet says, I looked on the earth and lo, it was waste and void. And, and in the heavens they had no light. I looked on the mountains and they were quaking and all the, the, the hills moved to and fro. I looked and there was no one at all. All of the birds of the air had fled. I looked and the fruitful land was a desert. And all its cities were laid in ruins before the Lord. Chaos seems to be happening. Humans, we humans, we sometimes treat the natural world, in fact, I'd say more than sometimes, I'd say often, we treat the natural world as if it were disposable rather than something good that God made. Now, without much trouble, we can discover how the earth is starting to look like chaos, isn't it? Fires, floods, hurricanes. And we have some part to play in that. Back at the beginning of September, I, we talked about how God is like a gardener, right? And back to this creation story, how God out of chaos created this beautiful, fruitful garden. And now, as foretold, chaos returns. The land became a desert. Living water, Jeremiah told us, was given up for dry cisterns that cracked. It seems like the life of the world, the life of the church, and even in our individual's life, in, in our individual lives, doesn't it seem sometimes that we move in a cycle of chaos to order, to chaos, to order, to chaos, to order? That's, that seems to be the cycle sometimes of creation. So what do we gain from chaos and what do we lose? What might it give us to help establish a new and more fruitful order? Well, um, I'm a huge fan of a guy named Parker Palmer. I don't know if any teachers here know about Park, Parker Palmer. Yes, wonderful author and he himself an educator, spent a life long, many years as a teacher. 
and he offers some wisdom on the personal experience of chaos that can, I think, apply to us as a community too. He says this in his book, Let Your Life Speak. The insight we receive on the inner journey is that chaos is the necessary precondition to creativity. As every creation myth has it, life itself emerged from the void. Even what has been created needs to be returned to chaos from time to time so that it can be regenerated in a more vital form. So, while chaos is not fun, although sometimes it can be a little fun, uh, and it can be hard to go through, and at times it might seem like it's endless, I want you to understand, I want you to hear that God loves to work with our, our crazy messes. <laughs> and God loves to call order and beauty out of the chaos of our lives. And so don't despair when you're going through a moment of chaos. Don't despair when there are moments where the world seems like it's just spinning out of control. Yes, it might be. But at the same time, God is calling and speaking into that chaos and calling out something good and beautiful and right and whole. Now, Jesus, in the story of Luke here, um, we hear some hopeful assurances here about something that's lost. Here he tells, in this passage of scripture, and he goes on and tells even more, he tells several stories about things that are lost and the effort that people go to to find what was lost. Now, the woman in this one story, she has 10 silver coins, but she loses one. Some of us might shrug that off, right? Well, one coin, I have nine others. You know, they're valuable too. I'll be okay. But this woman, for some reason, does not shrug it off. She searches the house thoroughly. She upends her home. It becomes chaotic while she searches for this one lost coin. And then she finds it, and she celebrates with wonder. She even tells her neighbors. Can you imagine the neighbors in this story? Like, uh, okay, lady, thanks for telling me, you know, about your lost coin that you found. Ooh, that's that crazy neighbor again, you know, right? But God says, you know what? I'm like that crazy neighbor lady. I love to find people, and I will celebrate when I do when I find one person who says yes and wants to work with me in the middle of all this chaos, I'm inviting people to come and work with me and help create something. And when someone says yes, oh, I celebrate. It's huge. I love it. Now, if we are being honest, sometimes we ourselves neglect the promises that we make with God and we sometimes find ourselves, rather than um, f opposing the forces of evil and wickedness, instead sometimes we find ourselves just kind of going along. Well, this is just the way the world is, so let's just put our head down and we'll, you know, I'll make it through okay, maybe, but this is just the way the world is. And yet we are called we're like that lost coin. We're like this chaotic mess that God is calling to, to us and inviting us to work with him. And I know it's frightening and I know it can feel humiliating to confess that sometimes we've broken our vows to God and to help God care for other people. Yet the ensuing chaos does not need to be the end of the world. In fact, it can be the beginning of a whole new world so to speak and so god i think is still calling to us even in the middle of all this chaos and the chaos of our life and the chaos of our world and is looking for us god still longs for us to come to him in return and become a part of the new beautiful order of things amen Let's pray. God, I thank you that you are not, um, you do not give up. Even as things seem to spin out of control and get chaotic, 
There you are speaking to us, calling us, inviting us to join you in a journey of creation and creating beauty and something good out of the chaos. We confess the times, uh, we confess that at times we are uh, selfish and we can sometimes fall into the order of things, greed and and looking to ourselves for out for ourselves first but god even then you look for us you search for us wanting us to be with you and work with you and god we want to say yes today we want to say yes and be a part of this new wonderful work that you're doing we love you god and in jesus name we pray amen